All right, I'm going to invite Andy Morrow from um, from Automat. Hi, Andy. <laughs> How you doing? Good. This is like way more fun than most of my evenings at this point. Right? It's so amazing. It's so good. Uh, we're so glad that you could join us, Andy. Um, obviously, you and I have known each other for a bit now, uh, collaborating on a few things. But for the others on the line, uh, it'd be mm -hmm. awesome if you could just quickly tell us about what Automat does. Sure. Um, really simply, we think of ourselves as a conversation company. And what that means is that we automate sales conversations and help retailers sell more online. That's awesome. And, uh, and that's a really important thing right now, because, uh, you know, as as we're seeing more and more um, brands looking to to move their their transactions to online, we're seeing that a lot of like in store experiences are, are not available anymore, because people are not going to brick and mortar as much. Yeah. So um, is there is there things that um, like experiences that Automat or that other companies you've seen in the space are helping create online that were potentially um, usually offline? Yeah, I mean, the question is, I think it's worth taking just like a small step back and even like marveling at the fact that we're asking ourselves that question, right? <laughs> like, I, like, I think everybody has known for a long time that brick and mortar converts out converts uh, e commerce by about seven times. Yeah. But we've never really had to ask ourselves the question, like, how do I bring my in store experience online, because yeah. there was always in store experiences. And I don't think any of us even up until a month, a month and a half ago could have anticipated that brick and mortar would be shut, like across basically every category that isn't grocery, yeah. right. And so that's i think this is a super interesting moment for people to ask themselves the question how do i bring my in-store experience online what is not what what am i not doing online that i do in my stores that i might have to think about doing if this was permanent and i think that's a way of leveling the parity on that 7x out conversion rate and so we think about it like the following and obviously you and i've talked about a lot about this a lot like this is just a small smattering of these things like how do i experience a physical product if i can only do it online sampler answers answers that pretty well like how do i try something on there's a whole bunch of like you know ucam does makeup try on and you've got like companies like wanna buy that does sneaker try on or 3d look that does apparel try on or you know, slice that does visual search. So there's like a whole bunch of companies out there. Um, the part of it that we try to automate is sales conversations, right? We think about someone walking into a store. Some people when greeted by a salesperson go, I just want to browse and they don't need any help. Some people <laughs> go, I, I know exactly what I want. And a salesperson basically provides the value of bringing them to the item and walking into the cash register. But you know, there's a very valuable class of customer, which is the person that walks in and knows that they want better hair or knows that they want better skin or knows that they want to look better in clothes or whatever it is, or right? it's going on a camping trip and they have a need, but they don't know how to fill it. And that's the time where a consumer is most open to being guided. And there's a real opportunity to create a super valuable and loyal customer. And so what we try to do is effectively automate that type of in-store uh, conversation in an online setting. Um, and, you know, turns out that that's one of the things that works. I don't think there's a panacea for anybody, but I think this yeah. idea of how do I, Benedict Evans, a famous VC has this, this, uh, phrase that he wrote about a year and a year and a half ago that said, you, you can sh buy as if you live in New York from anywhere, but you can't shop like you live that's in New York true. from anywhere. And I think that idea of in this moment, how do I we like make that. that whole experience better is like a very intriguing place to be. That's super awesome. And I think like the the kind of question that we're all wondering is, are these these changes where more and more um, brands and retailers are thinking more creatively about how to do an online experience? Like, are those changes going to be permanent? What do you think? I mean, I think the answer is for sure. Yes. Right. I mean, <laughs> there's there's something like, you know, 3% of people are now or are, 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 uh, or three out of 10 people are actually shopping for groceries online, but mm -hmm. for everything else, everybody's shopping online. And so I think that the, the question is like, here's a super fascinating stat that one of my customers gave me. It, was, it wasn't a stat, it was some, kind of an insight, which is they said they were seeing a lot more direct consumer traffic at their site. And their hypothesis for that is because Amazon is now servicing essentials, people still, this was a hair care brand, 
And, uh, and they, uh, they had said, people still need hair care. I mean, you guys had mentioned that all these sort of personal care things are actually really on the rise. People are pampering themselves and that's not just essentials, and, but they were rediscovering the brand as a place to buy directly. And so I think this isn't, there's a whole bunch of really interesting opportunities for things to become permanent. And it's not just shop online, right? Like, like Toby, the CEO at Shopify had mentioned the other day, he's like, Heinz is online. They're selling condiments <laughs> online. They're like a 150 year old brand. Like every business needs to be online. And like, yeah, I think the permanent thing is that every business now needs to figure out how to be online. And the baseline just went up for everybody else. 100%. Right. Like be, having, having a good browsing and payment and customer support, like that's the minimum that you can have to sell online. And yeah. so I think the real question is not, are these changes permanent? Is buying online permanent? It's like, what's the new bar is, is the question uh, that I think is really interesting yeah. for folks that are both good at e-com today and those that are bad at e-com today. Yeah, it's time that we all try and stand out with our e-commerce experience for sure. Totally. Yeah. I was talking to um, some of our emerging brands who had, you know, the idea of launching in retail first before yeah. going D to C, which, you know, yeah. some brands are doing. And overnight they had to completely change their plan, uh, their business plan. And so yeah. that's interesting. Um, Alex, are you already? Okay. <laughs> um, so now, what we're seeing though is that obviously i'm assuming like not everyone is adapting at the same pace right and i i definitely have seen that so i wondered if if you had some um some intel on that well i mean this is like where i get in trouble for sure because it's like <laughs> we, we work with very big corporates like we work with many global multinational holding companies and then we work with many you know sort of startups and and smaller direct to consumer e-com companies and like I think there's good news and there's bad news, right? And it, it, it basically falls exactly how you would expect it to, right? Like big corporates tend to clamp shut and it's not their fault. There's many great things about big corporate companies and in terms of the things they can do um, that smaller companies can't do, but the decision-making chain is very long. And so when there's this amount of uncertainty, it's very hard to figure out who knows the answer. Whereas what we are seeing is, you know, some of the smaller D 2 C companies are, they're more entrepreneurial. I mean, they approach this opportunity, like you and I approach this opportunity and every other startup approaches this opportunity, which is like, what is our responsibility to our teams and our customers in this moment? And, and, you know, first and foremost, and then secondly, how do we, how do we capitalize on this, but in not a scummy way, right? Like how do we push <laughs> our businesses forward and get creative and smart and whatever? And I think like what you're seeing, like we we we're actually doing a webinar tomorrow with this this customer Amika, who's a who's a, a direct consumer hair care company, and like we launched a flash sale using the conversational technology that we built for them in like four days or something, and then they did fifty percent higher conversion on that. Like that's the kind of speed and just kind of like fire that a D two C company has that I think mm -hmm. the bigger corporates are getting better at, but are still struggling to do. And so I think it's a good time if you. If you're looking for ways to to innovate and um, invest your way through this, if you're a little bit smaller and you're a little bit nimbler, I think this is a great opportunity for you. And I think if you're a big corporate, this is a great opportunity to like stress test your ability to move fast and invest, right? A as opposed to clamp shut in this moment. Yeah. So, um, so the answer is no. People are not operating at the same speed. They're operating at the speed that you would expect them to, whether they were big or small. But I. Um, I don't think I, I will say this. Everyone has been really in their own way, creative and fast moving mm -hmm. just at different scales. So for sure. And I think you, like you made a good point about Amazon being really focused on essential services. Like we're telling our emerging brands like this is the perfect time uh, for you to really be pushing your category, your brand uh, at on a D2C because Amazon's busy selling toilet paper right now, yeah. right? So, yeah. um, so it's definitely something to to keep in mind. Um, and we're we're seeing kind of uh, some trends around media. So we have a few minutes left. Um, is mm -hmm. there any things uh, you're seeing on how maybe the media teams are adapting? I know there's a lot of marketers on the line today. I mean, that's when we had talked about this. Like, that's another one that's sort of like is there's an interesting parallel for companies like us that see both sides. Like we see mm -hmm. the biggest media spending companies in the world. And then we see sort of the leanest like D to C companies in the world. And one observation that I think is really interesting is that the, the D to C companies, like the person that runs media, 
like often sits right next to the person that is in charge of e-commerce. And one observation from working with a bunch of the, the much larger holding companies that we worked with is those people sometimes don't even know each other and they definitely don't work together in the same way. And everybody, and I think what it is, is I think like, I look at it through almost like a management metrics perspective. The media people care about like cost per click and impressions and they don't necessarily have anything to do with conversion downstream. And for some mm -hmm. of the biggest, you know, big companies like D 2 C is, is their secondary tertiary caternary like channel. And so they don't necessarily even care about e-commerce performance the way that a company for whom their e-com is primary or secondary. Right. Mm -hmm. And so what I've seen is like when you put the people together, the media people together with the e-com people and you say this campaign where we're driving traffic, let's talk about how we actually take that traffic tell a cohesive story up funnel as we get to our site, actually provide value and capture people in the way that we need to. And like actually treat the whole thing as like, let the e-com people care about the implementation on the site and how it, how the media story is helping tell that and like get those teams talking together because that's like this flash sale that we did with this customer. Like they said, we have a bunch of product. No, like nobody wants it right now. We don't know how to move it. We literally don't have a channel. Could we put this through the experience we did with you? And they got a 50% higher conversion rate because the media and the actual conversion moment together. like played came together. So I think it's really like stick those two teams together because what you definitely see with this, this webinar we're doing tomorrow, uh, Commerce Next is one of the companies who pulled 100 uh, retailers, both large and small. And across the board, they saw a media pullback. Like, there's no question the first thing people stop doing is advertising, which is crazy because there's that old, like, Harry Henry Ford quote that's <laughs> like, you know, like people that stop advertising in a crisis or like stopping your like watch to stop time or something like that. Like, you know, it's not, it doesn't really have the impact. But, but I think um, we're seeing everybody drop their media spend. And then we're seeing, you know, smaller, nimbler folks think about how do I take this smaller media spend, but out convert it. And so, and I just think like for us as a startup too, like I look at what we're doing right now and I go, there's five things we're doing today that we weren't doing a month ago that we <laughs> could have been doing pre-crisis, yeah. but the fear and like, you know, just maybe, maybe, maybe being at home and working 15 hours a day is making you, <laughs> making you smarter. And I think this is an opportunity for everybody who's listening, whether they're big corporate, whether they're small D to C, like everybody can get a little smarter about their business and it learn from each you other. It forces to focus too, right? Yeah. Like those, yeah. like certainly there's some new business models, but I, I think there's a lot more focus too.